Hello and welcome to the final Longwood Seminar of 2011, Food for Thought, Genetically Modified Nourishment. Uh, my name is David Cameron and I'm the Director of External Relations here at the Medical School and I'm delighted to be here and delighted to see all of you here um, as we think pretty seriously about the emerging science of genetically modified food. So for the last few decades, the value of genetically modified or otherwise known as GM food, um, has been hotly challenged and debated. And we are lucky to have some extraordinary people on faculty here at Harvard University um, who are studying the technology and the processes behind GM food and the policy issues, both nationally and globally. So I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Pamela Silver. She's a professor of systems biology here at the medical school, and she's a faculty member, actually I think a founding faculty member, of uh, the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. She currently holds a merit award from the National Institutes of Health. She served on numerous government and private advisory panels, and one of the areas that her lab focuses on is synthetic biology, particularly on the predictable design of biological systems. So uh, please welcome Dr. Pam Silver. Thank you for that introduction, David. Um, and thank you all for coming out um, to talk about my favorite subject, food. Um, and I guess you're postponing dinner for that. Um, <laughs> So my, my interest really lies in sustainability. Um, and so my interests extend beyond food. My real interest is in the idea that I think biology is the technology of this century. What I'm going to talk about is how we apply that technology to food. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how we as humans have been actually engineering food for many, many centuries. And then I'm going to segue into the more modern approaches of how we do it, um, so we can all sort of be on the same page when we ask questions about safety and policy, et cetera. And then I'm gonna end with a little story about a project that some Harvard undergraduates did last summer that I directed. Um, that is part of a competition, so that you can appreciate the, the interest from young people in what I think is a very important area. Now, in thinking about food, it's really about sunlight. So sunlight is probably our greatest natural resource. You need sun for just about everything we do, especially for growing plants, obviously. Um, this is one reason that um, countries that get a lot of sunlight are going to probably have an advantage as we go forward, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the next talk. Now, there are fundamentally on Earth two strategies by which um, organisms harness sunlight by the process that we call photosynthesis. We're mainly going to be talking about plants, I'm going to interject a little tiny bit about bacteria that harvest sunlight because, in fact, these bacteria, which are called cyanobacteria, live in the ocean, and they account for about 50% of the photosynthesis that goes on on Earth. So they are not to be ignored in this discussion, and I'll tell you a little bit about, how, about our interests in using them to generate food. All right, so food. Let's talk about food. This is broccoli. There's lots of broccoli out there. I find myself buying tons of broccoli these days. Is there an overabundance of it? Um, okay, there's cabbage, uh, cauliflower, um, collards, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts. So, so these are all, what do these all have in common? Does anyone know? Uh, they're all members of the same species. They're all part of the brassica family. In fact, this is the original this is sort of the founding member of that family. It's a mustard grass. It lives on the coasts in Europe. And so how do we go from this to this? How do we go from a mustard grass to a whole cabbage? This is a process of humans interacting with food for 
many, many years. And I'm going to show you a few other examples. The tomato, okay? So the tomato is a fruit. It starts out, started out very small, but as humans, we prefer the tastier, juicier, bigger ones that last longer. Um, so forget about those other ones. Um, <laughs> And, and we, we want to make them even bigger, right? You, you get these tomatoes now that are huge. Um, it's amazing to me. And they're, they're quite tasty, too. So from, we go from evolution of survival of the fittest to now survival of the tastiest, right? So, so we as humans um, apply different properties to the foods that we, that we like to eat. So here again, here's the tomato. This is actually a cherry, essentially a cherry. And now look where we're at. So let's talk about corn. Corn is a grass. Um, and here is uh, teosinte, which most of you are probably familiar with. And here's the corn that we like to buy out there in those farms in Western Mass now. Now what's interesting is um, you can sort of see the evolution of corn here by looking at this intermediate, and we know this is an intermediate in the evolution of the corn we eat for a couple reasons. It's really quite interesting. First of all, if you take this corn and mate it with teosinte, you can get this out of that, you can get this as a product of that mating. So that indicates that buried in the genetics of these, of these corn exists the genes that can produce this. Also, if you look back at the Mayan ruins, um, you can find corn that looks just like this. You can also find this. So the Mayans used thousands of years to evolve corn. So this is just a map. Um, I, I know it's hard to see, but just to give you a sense of sort of the ancient engineering of plants and, and to take away the, the idea that humans have been interacting with plants and with food for many, many, many years. This is not a novel idea, obviously. Um, however, what, has, what is in the more modern gestalt is, is the systematic engineering of plants and, and plant breeding. And that's really the, the sort of what we're, we're talking about more now. And the re the plant breeding comes about by more knowledge from science and the understanding that plants essentially have sex. Um, so you can see here to those who are not acquainted with the botanical con construction of plants, it may be well to explain that plants possess generative organs which correspond to those of male and female in the animal kingdom. Under our system of plant breeding, we carry the mating of varieties or breeds far beyond what is practiced in the animal kingdom. So we're already engineers. Um, we mate varieties, and also what were formerly regarded as distinct species. And after fixation, the progeny of these combinations are further mated together. So, so we've really been messing around with the genetics of these organisms for a long time. So don't think that what you're buying there in the grocery store is something that just spontaneously arose. These are coming out of human design. I know that's a loaded word. Um, okay, so here we have an example of selective breeding. If we cross two different kinds of plants and we can get out all kinds of different by things by Mendelian genetics, and then we can pick the one that we like best and then continue to propagate that. And then, of course, we have here Norman Borlaug, who is called the father of the green revolution for breeding a wheat that is shorter and can grow at higher density. And if you look at this in a positive way, it had a big impact on developing countries such as India and I believe in Africa as well. Um, so, so this is, to me, a positive example of this kind of plant breeding. Now we move more into the modern era. So now we can sequence the gene, the genomes. I, I was in China recently um, at the Beijing Genome Institute. They can sequence, they have bought one third of what we call the next gen sequencing machinery that is produced, which means that now they can do 10 humans a day in the 
not too distant future, they will be sequencing 100 humans a day. But that's actually not what they're so interested in. They're more interested in food. And so, in fact, what they're doing is sequencing all rice species. So what this leads to is a different way of doing selections. So say we have a genetic trait that we like, and this, these correspond to the genes that come out of those crosses that I showed you. And we have little genetic markers. These are pieces of DNA that differ between each one that comes out of the cross. And we can find these. Any, this is really easy to do. And so now we can go through and probe genetically using molecular biology and genetic techniques to get the one that we want. So we don't even have to look at it anymore. We can go in using the power of sequencing genes and molecular biology to start to pick out the foods that we want. This is still not really messing with the DNA. It's, it's about analyzing it. So this, this, is, this approach has led to um, flood-tolerant rice, which you can see here. Um, now, the thing that we're here really to discuss, and that's genetically modifying the DNA directly. And there are two general ways to do that. Um, one is by using a bacteria that will actually sit on the plant and transfer its DNA into the plant. So this is something that occurs in nature that people have now harnessed to use to genetically transform plants, to add new DNA or new genes to plants. The other, believe it or not, is a gun. Um, it's very hard to get DNA into plants, and so there's something called a gene gun where you literally put it up right up next to the plant and it will shoot the DNA into the, gun, into the plant. This is, this is the way that, by the way, most companies do it. All right, I, wa I want to mention bacteria for a moment. These are the photosynthetic, can you, can you see green and red here if you're not colorblind? I, I hope so. Um, these are the cyanobacteria that can harvest sunlight. And the red is, is their, their photosynthetic machinery. And the green dots correspond to the region where they fix carbon. So carbon fixation is also a critical part of this process. And I can blow these up for you. Um, this is actually one of the things we work on in my laboratory. We're trying to get these to make food, for example. So we've gotten them to make sugar. Sugar is a... Uh, um, what's called a high-value commodity. Its price fluctuates all the time. We need it all the time. So the advantage here is you can have bacteria that harvest, that need only sunlight and carbon and have them produce sugar. And this is some real biology, um, but I think you can understand it. This big green glob corresponds to E. coli, which normally lives in your gut. And these red cells are those little photosynthetic bacteria that are making sugar. The E. coli need sugar in order to grow. So these are growing only because they're getting sugar from these bacteria. So this is a way to prove that the bacteria are actually making sugar. So what this says is that we can use not only plants, but we could also use bacteria to harvest sunlight and make things. So lastly, I want to tell you a little bit about the project of some very clever Harvard undergraduates. Um, and this was part of a competition that we run every summer. And by the way, some of you are high school teachers here. We're going to have a high school track um, this summer. So this is a competition called the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. It truly is international. We started this here at Harvard and MIT about um, seven years ago. It has grown to include teams of undergraduates from about uh, around 80 countries, I think, and there's uh, been, it's grown too big to be accommodated by any auditorium here in, in, in Boston at any of the schools and it's going to become regionalized, but we have teams from Africa, from South America, uh, from the U.S. and from Europe, and they all, quote, compete to 
make a genetic machine. Um, and what do we mean by a genetic machine? We mean some kind of living organism that will do something interesting. So this is an undergraduate competition. And as I added, it's a high school competition too. And there have been high school students in the past who've competed, mostly from, um, SF, from San Francisco. SF State um, takes on a number of um, high school students. It's also open source, so anybody can participate. And, and we were big believers in, 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 we're not trying to patent things. We're trying to make this an open environment for everybody. And um, the hope is by teaching undergraduates and young people about biological engineering that they will think about solving the big problems, such as what to do about food. So the Harvard team last summer thought about the future of food. Um, and that was, I think, particularly exciting for us. Um, and what they imagined was something like a genetically engineered farmer's market, um, for example. Um, why? Well, this, you could customize plants for local needs or environments. Um, they weren't thinking Monsanto style. They were thinking locally. Um, they also thought about increasing nutrition. Um, they, they spent time thinking about the environmental and social con consequences of what they were trying to do. So it was educational broadly beyond biological. So here is one of their, their thoughts, was that you could make a customized garden. So what would you want in your customized garden? Well, you might want to use less fertilizer and pesticide. You might want drought resistance. Um, you might want uh, things you're concerned about if you're concerned about your allergies. You might want flowers of different colors, um, decorative plants flavors. These were all things that they thought about. And I'm going to just show you one brief example. Um, they were interested in allergies. So many of you probably right now are taking Claritin or whatever. I know everyone I know says, oh my god, my allergies are breaking out. But there are some allergies. People, there are people who have allergies that are very rare. Um, some people are allergic to tomatoes. Um, and so these are not broad allergies. They're never going to be treated um, by the medical community. But imagine if you could locally grow your own food that you weren't allergic to. So this was the concept that the, the students tried to propagate. And they made a kit that they called the eye garden. It's very cute. Um, this is, it's not real, by the way. This is a mock. Um, and, but their vision was to make food that was safe by genetic engineering to make plants that didn't have allergens, particular allergens in them. Um, and this was done by what we call knocking down genes um, that could eliminate the allergen for a particular person. So you can imagine customizing plants for your own personal needs. Um, in addition, the approach that they used was novel and could help to make food safer um, for many people. OK, so they called it the Harvard Eye Garden. And you can, here's their website. It's great. You can go there. Um, they didn't win the competition. We felt sort of burned by that. Um, for some reason, Slovenia always wins. We haven't figured that out. <laughs> um, but we thought we were winners, and everyone's a winner. And so I'm going to end there. Um, I, I know there'll be questions later. And I um, also want to an, acknowledge these wonderful slides were, were made by a group of students in my laboratory. So thank you very much. So I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kolestus Juma. Uh, Dr. Juma is Professor of the Practice of International Development at the Harvard Kennedy School. He directs the Agricultural Innovation Project in Africa funded by the Gates Foundation. And he has been elected to several scientific academies and was Executive, uh, executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, a group that established uh, trade rules for genetically modified crops. His latest book, The New Harvest Agricultural Innovation in Africa, was just published by Oxford University Press. So, Dr. Juma. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Pam, Pam's presentation makes it look like there, there shouldn't be any controversies around, uh, around this issue. And uh, so what I wanted to cover is just give you my own thoughts on why, despite the fact that technology offers such promise uh, to solve a wide range of agricultural problems, uh, it's also been associated with major political debates. Uh, I have been working a little bit with uh, African leaders. This is a study uh, I prepared not long ago at their request to advise them on what to do because they were getting mixed messages. They were getting view critics telling them that this is not a very safe technology and at the same time hearing from private companies uh, telling them that this is the technology that will solve all their problems. So I put together a panel to, that prepared the report uh, that we presented to African presidents. And they have been acting on it uh, since then. This report came out about three years ago. Really builds on some work I did earlier. My first book on this topic was 1989, uh, in which, in fact, I had visualized more or less the scenario that Pam just painted of using a genetic modification to move towards decentralized agricultural systems that take into account uh, ecological diversity across, uh, across the continents. And so I had visualized some discontinuities in agriculture, but I didn't have really a very good sense of how controversial uh, this was likely to be. Uh, I subsequently got a job in the UN uh, managing Basically, most of my time was spent on managing political debates among, among prima donnas, also called sovereign states. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the course of uh, sitting there running a fairly large meetings, and by the way, I should just say that the, the reason I actually came to, to Harvard was I was escaping the UN controversies. And when I came here, I did not want to have anything to do with a genetically modified foods at all. I had had enough of the debates. Uh, and I picked Harvard because I thought going to a very large institution, you could actually keep a very low profile, and nobody would have a clue whether you had actually come from some controversial place. And I think I was very successful. This is the largest gathering I've been to at Harvard since I came here 11 years ago. Uh, so, so, but I can, looking at you, I was thinking, God, Harvard caught up with me. <laughs> It took, it took only 11 years, <laughs> but, it, but it finally did. And when sitting up there listening to governments, uh, I started to construct an image of uh, how different governments think about risk uh, and the variations of perceptions about risk that influenced uh, the, positions that they, the positions that they took. Uh, I had to think because it was a very, very boring setting where you are sitting up there on the podium uh, looking at two to 3,000 people every two or three weeks, I would hold conferences of that size, uh, de debating different aspects of this issue of genetically modified foods. Extremely passionate debate, so you kind of, you, and you couldn't stay, you couldn't close your eyes when 2,000 people are actually looking at you and you are the executive secretary. So I started making some observations. Whenever the United States rep representative spoke, it was very clear they, they, they thought of products as being safe first until they are proven uh, risky. That was the position of uh, the United States. I'm thinking of the United States as a hypothetical country, not the country that we live in. And then another country called France, they had exactly the opposite view. They considered products to be risky until proven safe. So you can obviously see that these are very conflicting, very conflicting perspectives. And it started, I started to see variations on this theme of perception of risk. Uh, the UK products were considered risky even when proven safe. Uh, in India, products were considered safe even when proven risky. Uh, and in Canada, pro products were neither safe nor risky. 
Uh, this was, by the way, volunteered to me. This formulation on Canada was volunteered to me by a Canadian delegate uh, when, when, I, when I showed him my, my view of, uh, of sovereign states. Uh, in Japan, products were either safe or risky. Uh, in Brazil, they were both safe and risky because <laughs> at that time, Brazil had divided up the country into two regions. One was growing genetically modified soybean, and the other one wasn't, catering for the two different markets, for the US market and the, and the European market. And then there was this Africa where products were risky, even if they didn't exist. <laughs> uh, so, so my colleagues from Africa, I'm originally from Kenya, were passionately debating the risks of genetically modified foods. And I would ask them, do you have any? And they said, no, we don't. But they were very, very engaged in this, uh, in this debate. Uh, basically, they, they, this process created a treaty that basically presumed, uh, driven by this idea of, of precaution, basically, which is the European idea. Uh, basically, uh, the assumption was that uh, no country should be prevented to take action in banning imports of genetically modified foods simply because there wasn't sufficient evidence uh, showing the risks. So it basically reversed the burden of proof uh, away from them, the, the importers demonstrating that the products were unsafe, uh, to exporters, asking exporters to demonstrate that the products were safe. Basically asking the exporters to, to prove a negative. Uh, that's the treaty that came out of, uh, out of that process. Uh, has been adopted by many countries. In fact, countries are now trying to figure out a way of, of wriggling out of these very tight commitments because the, the, the foundation upon which this treaty was negotiated was the assumption that these products were fast and safe and then the owners was in the producers to demonstrate uh, that, they were, uh, that they were actually safe. Uh, my own observation of the, of the debates at the time was that a large part of the controversy was not really about the science. Many countries used the uncertainty around safety of products, but if you dug deeper, what you found was really socioeconomic considerations. Countries being worried about cheaper produce from the US that don't involve the use of chemicals, for example, crops that are genetically engineered not to, use, not to require chemicals are cheaper to produce and they will crowd out other products that were basically produced using uh, more expensive methods. And so a large part of my work has been really exploring this, this theme of how socioeconomic considerations influence uh, public debates. But usually uh, those who are concerned about the economic impact of new products uh, don't say that the new products might affect their product they think of ways by which they can cast doubt on the safety of the product. Uh, and because we can't be certain, we can't be 100% certain about what we are doing, that becomes the basis upon which many of the debates get constructed. Hence, the, the formulation of the Cartagena Protocol, which is basically to shift the burden of proof uh, to the producer, basically demand that the, pro the producer does something that's almost impossible, which is to play God, which is to know everything in advance. Um, and so, so that's really my, my view of what influences most of these debates uh, is, a, is the socioeconomic considerations. And, and as soon as you get to those uh, deeper economic foundations for controversy, it's a lot easier to get people around the table and to start having a more substantive discussion because you know who is likely to win or gain whenever a new technology is a uh, is introduced. Many regulatory uh, systems, particularly the, food, the FDA system here, really they have a hard time dealing with the socioeconomic issues because the foundation for their decision making is the science. And yet the controversies are not driven by science, they are driven essentially by perceptions of loss uh, or, uh, uh, or benefits. Uh, one other last observation I wanted, I wanted just to share with you is that uh, when society perceives that the benefits of a product, a new product, will accrue to a small section of society and the risks are likely to be spread more widely, you get a negative reaction to a product. Uh, secondly, if there's a perception that the benefits uh, will, will emerge only in the long run and the risks are likely to be felt in the short run, 
uh, you get a negative reaction to a product. And in many of the biotechnology products, we've actually had uh, basically convergence of those two factors where people think that all the benefits are accruing, are going to, to large scale corporations and the risks are being spread through society. Or that we really don't know what's likely to happen to uh, human beings even in the short run. Uh, and that's what basically inspires a, a sense of anxiety about new products. Uh, there used to be a, a view that uh, that much of the opposition was really a consequence of ignorance. There have been a lot of studies showing that, in fact, uh, the more educated people were, the more skeptical they were. So all the early programs by big corporations to try to educate the public, they just basically got nowhere. They just got the public even more agitated uh, because it had less to do with uh, their lack of knowledge but to do with this idea of how they perceive, how human beings perceive, uh, perceive risks. Um, I will just, if you don't mind, I will, I will try to get to uh, probably more interesting things because I had some, uh, uh, I have some cartoons to show at the end. Uh, the, the, the European Union was the, probably the most forceful critic of genetically modified foods. Uh, and, and at least in my work, I was dealing with the European Union as a, as a serious player they had this idea of the precautionary principle embodied in the, in the Treaty of Maastricht that created the European Union. So they had an obligation to, uh, to champion it. Uh, it's really interesting, after spending uh, roughly 300 million uh, uh, euros uh, on a research program that started in 1982, they have come to the conclusion that the risks associated uh, with the genetically modified foods, at least the foods that exist on the market today uh, are similar to the risks associated with the conventional foods, uh, which is basically, which was the original position developed by the National Academy of Sciences here. Uh, and so after, after almost 30 years of scrutiny, very, in, very detailed scrutiny, the European Commission has come forward and basically said these foods are, uh, carry the same risks as conventional foods. There is nothing unique about about the risks that they, they actually carry. And that has changed the debate quite a bit in terms of how developing countries, particularly African countries that are somehow connected uh, economically with Europe, are now thinking about really developing their own biotechnology programs because they are no longer being told by the European Union's, Union uh, diplomats uh, not to promote uh, genetically modified foods. It basically opened up the space for greater exploration. The challenge is really uh, the existence of capabilities among African countries to start breeding crops of relevance to their, to their needs. Uh, some of this is starting to happen. I, I can talk a little bit uh, later on about it in a, when we get to the Q&A period. Uh, this is a, basically the trends. We, this is probably the fastest uh, uh, agricultural product uh, adoption of all times, roughly 12% per year. Uh, as you can see, almost all regions of the world have adopted, a, a, a product, I mean, are already producing and uh, using on a fairly large scale genetically modified product. This is really uh, interesting because some, many of them are European countries, as you can see uh, uh, from the top. You have uh, Spain. Uh, Germany, uh, Sweden, Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia, Romania, uh, and the number of European countries that are going to be launching new biotech products in the, in the next five years is significantly increasing. So this is also sending a different signal to the African countries, which is that the countries that originally told them these foods were not safe are themselves starting to adopt them. And that's changing the, the way the debate uh, is, is being conducted. Uh, much of the focus, again, is very limited to a very small number of, of crops, still the conventional crops like soybean, maize, cotton, and, uh, and, and canola, uh, where the rate of adoption in soybean has been the highest, uh, followed by cotton, uh, maize, and to some degree, uh, some degree canola. The, and again, the traits that are being 
used in agriculture today are equally <laughs> limited. There are basically three traits, herbicide tolerance, uh, insect resistance, and a combination of those two. So in a way, the industry has been very, very conservative in terms of the, the traits that they have actually put on the market. Uh, if you look at their pipelines, they have a lot more products in the pipeline that they are very cautious to actually put, uh, put to the marketplace. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the fact that this debate is not new. When I came to Harvard, I decided to look around and see whether there was anything unique in the way these socioeconomic considerations were influencing the, the debate on the genetically modified foods and whether I could find any examples elsewhere uh, that demonstrate similar patterns of, of, uh, of controversy. And the one area that I just, I was looking around and said, let me look at some products that we consume on a, day, on a daily basis that we take for granted. And I started to look at coffee and I found out that there had been something like 250 years of controversy on whether coffee was safe or not. Uh, in fact, there was more, con coffee was more controversial than nuclear power. Uh, and this, so, so I started looking up, looking up material on, uh, on coffee, and it's extremely interesting uh, with the story of coffee, which is uh, essentially uh, when people started to observe that coffee was starting to di displace traditional beverages. Again, the economic competition argument. Uh, this is a, a great poem by a, a, an Italian uh, who basically said this seditious disturber of the world has by its unparalleled virtue supplanted all wines from this blessed day. So if you are a wine producer, a coffee wouldn't be your favorite, uh, favorite beverage. But a lot was written at that time on how risky coffee was. Uh, there just many studies and efforts by scientists, uh, me particularly medical professionals used a lot to try to demonstrate that coffee was really terrible for the human body. In fact, in many cases, the, the, the medical profession was right. <laughs> uh, then the, very quickly, coffee spread into Europe. Uh, and as soon as it got into Europe, it got described by people who are concerned with its impact both on wine and milk consumption, as particularly led by the church as the devil's or Saturn's drink. And for a long time, it was demonized as Saturn's drink until a few bishops thought that the time was just right to put this to the Pope so that the, the Pope could excommunicate uh, the coffee from the Christian world. And when they gave it to Pope Clement VIII, he looked, sipped it and said, why, this Saturn's drink is so delicious. <laughs> it would be a pity to have the infidels have exclusive use of it. We shall fool Saturn by baptizing it and making it a truly Christian beverage. Uh, so, so when the dispute between the, the EU and, and the US ended up to, uh, the, w, the World Trade Organization for, for Settlement, I thought, oh, this, I've seen this before. It has already happened, it has already happened with the coffee where it was taken over, taken up to, the, to high authority to, uh, to rule on it. Uh, the economic impacts when it got in, in, the, in the UK were very evident. And so a debate erupted in the UK uh, over the safety of coffee, uh, partly because it was competing with beer, then it was also competing with tea, which had just been introduced a few decades before that. Uh, and people started to observe the economic impact. And then what followed was a debate on whether coffee was safe or not, not because it was displacing uh, other beverages, but whether it was safe for human consumption or not. Uh, in 1674, there was a, a petition, very interesting petition, signed by women uh, against coffee. It's a very long petition that had all, has all sorts of very legitimate grievances, which include the fact that we, men were spending most of their time uh, is drinking coffee instead of being at home. But uh, the interesting part of it was the claim that coffee caused impotence. Uh, and, uh, and then the obvious economic argument that they spend their money uh, all on a little base, black, thick, nasty, bitter, stinking, uh, nauseous puddle of water. The following year, the King of England bans coffee uh, in December. It's a big, big route in London. He actually had to revoke, uh, revoke that decision. 
Then in France, similar debates when, I, when I, it was perceived that coffee was starting to compete with wine. Uh, French doctors kicked in. I, I'm using this very deliberately being here at Harvard Medical School. Uh, but they went further than that. They recruited their students to do a dissertation on the impact, whether, there was, whether coffee had any negative impacts on the inhabitants of Marseille. Uh, and a student concluded that, in fact, it led to this general exhaustion, paralysis, and impotence. Impotence keeps coming up uh, at all. <laughs> In fact, there was a study uh, out of Europe a couple of years ago sh suggesting that genetically modified foods caused impotence. And, and I have come, and I've co I've come across impotence in regard to margarine and a lot of other products. So when I see impotence being invoked, I know it's becoming really desperate. Uh, <laughs> and and in, I, I think this is my favorite one, which is in Germany, Frederick the Great declared that it was disgusting to see how much coffee was being consumed. I wanted it stopped, so my, my people must drink beer. His majesty was brought up on beer, and so were, we, so were his ancestors. Many battles have been fought and won on soldiers nourished by beer. Uh, I, I find this interesting because this is a national security argument <laughs> being invoked to keep out beer. He did a lot of other uh, interesting things, like paying people to go around sniffing if you are found uh, uh, smelling coffee, you are fine on the spot, and the sniffers kept half the money. Uh, so there was an incentive for people to kind of weed out uh, this, the coffee consumption. He introduced all sorts of restrictions on how much uh, coffee could be bought. The quantitative restrictions uh, were introduced at the time. Uh, in Sweden, if you are caught drinking coffee, your cups and dishes were confiscated. <laughs> uh, not a very good way to uh, confront the authorities. It wasn't around the 1820s that finally the government gave up and uh, stopped issuing decrees against, uh, uh, against coffee. Now, I'm, I'm offering this as an allegory, essentially, because there are real parallels uh, between the story of coffee, a product we really take for granted, and I'm sure that at some point in the future, uh, so many of these products that are very controversial today uh, will become, in fact, commonplace. And there are a number of things that uh, kind of lessons we learn from this. Uh, one is uh, to accept the fact that uncertainty in our knowledge base is the norm. And the only way we improve that is to basically expand our research programs, do more experimentation, and learn more. But we cannot uh, eliminate it. Uh, and, and many of the regulatory practices that restrict genetically modified foods assume that certainty is the norm. Uh, I, take the view that uncertainty is the, uh, is the norm. Secondly, really being able to think about perceptions, not the reality, it's not the reality, but the perceptions about risks that drive the debates. Uh, so you can do all the science that is needed to demonstrate that the products are safe. It's not going to reassure the public. Uh, and many of those, as I pointed out, are driven by socioeconomic losses and benefits. The issues of, when you hear the products being demonized, you know that that's headed in the direction of wanting to have them prohibited or banned. Uh, and one other area that I just wanted to point out, which is thinking about how, how new products kind of fit into existing uh, traditions so that you are not too disruptive. Uh, we've, and that helps a lot in the diffusion of new products, which is finding out uh, what the real needs are. There are really very interesting products that are being developed now that have nutritional benefits. And these are not going to be controversial because they fit into people's expectations and what they see as their needs. But my, my other favorite one is this area of uh, rulings and compromises, of really finding ways by which uh, the, the incumbent industries and new producers and new technologies can find uh, compromises so that they can either combine their products or share markets uh, so that everybody need, feels included. My favorite example of this is really go, goes back to coffee again. Cafe au lait was a big debate on whether to sell coffee or to sell uh, milk. And somebody said, why don't you just mix it up? Uh, that's how we ended up with cafe, with cafe au lait was a, was, a, was a compromise. In fact, a lot of the beverages uh, that we consume are products of of, of, of these compromises. 
and more importantly, finding new markets uh, where you, are, you don't have competitors, being very innovative enough to find new markets either in terms of space or in terms of uses. The internet was able to diffuse very rapidly without ma major initial controversies because it was a radically new market that wasn't being served by, by, by other products. Uh, and uh, so, so I wanted to leave you with this, with this message, uh, which, is, uh, which is really that uh, the, the, the concerns about the safety of new products, whether it's environmental or health, are legitimate and need to be addressed. Uh, this is not to diminish their importance. But I, I want to emphasize that it's really important to dig deeper than those concerns, that every time you dig deeper than those concerns, you find out that there are socioeconomic considerations. And until you get to those socioeconomic considerations, you could do all the important work uh, needed to establish safety of products, but you still get resistance. And that resistance, the solution, the resistance have to be sought uh, in a different arena, which is the socioeconomic space, uh, which is basically really thinking about who loses and who benefits when a new, a new technology is uh, is being introduced. So thank you, thank you all for your attention. I think I'm just, uh, I've just taken more time than I, I was supposed to. So I will seed my extra Q and A questions to, to Pam if that's. that's, that's. <laughs> thank you to the both of you for those wonderful presentations. So we have uh, a lot of people had a lot of questions, and I'm trying to sort of uh, group them together and, and classify them as best as I can. Um, one question, and this is to either one of you, so feel free to jump in. Um, if we are genetically modifying crops, aren't we also genetically modifying crop disease? <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure how to begin to answer that. Um, I can think, I'll give an example um, of what I think that you might be speaking to. Um, so when you, and, and it's a little bit scientific. So it is true, and this is something that has to be confronted that when you use, often when genetically modified crops are used, they, they're used because they have a number of advantages, but then the crop, all the plants become identical. Um, and then this makes them more susceptible to disease, to viruses coming in and potentially destroying them. So this is a scientific um, situation that needs to be, um, that can be solved, and, it, and I think it's to the advantage of all of us for scientists or companies to solve the problem. Now that's how I think about that question. I'm not sure how you think about it. There is actually a practical uh, side to this, which is uh, when, say, genetically modified crops, or crops that have been genetically modified to, say, uh, resist certain pests, and then over time, you have the evolution of pests that, are, that can attack them. And this area of development of resistance uh, to the traits that we've developed is starting to become a big challenge. And my response to that, which is basically, uh, is to say, maybe we need more research and not less of it, because the, those who are concerned about resistance to, that the pests will develop resistance, tend to come to the conclusion that therefore we don't need genetically modified products. My argument would be to actually try to stay ahead of the, of the pests, because what's happened with the chemicals is, is the pests developed resistance to chemicals, but we are not inventing chemicals uh, fast enough to keep up with the rate at which the pests were developing resistance. 
So, so it, the response to that is to do more science rather than less. Uh, Dr. Juma, do you see the U.S. adopting your, the European view on GMOs? Ad adopting the? Could you, uh, could you ask the question again? What's that? Could you ask? Oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the person asked, uh, addressing to you specifically, do you see the U.S. adopting uh, the European view on GMOs? What seems to be happening is uh, some degree of convergence in, uh, in practices where Europe is actually moving faster into adopting some of the uh, U.S. practices, especially practices where one has to uh, provide some evidence of harm before you can uh, remove a product from the marketplace. Uh, that is a European, uh, an American idea that is now being uh, accepted by Europeans in agriculture, even though Europeans have been practicing it in the medical, in the medical field. <laughs> That's a practice in medicine. But in, when it comes to agriculture, they have a different standard. Uh, the, the U.S. is thinking a lot about how to trace, in case there is a problem, how do you tr trace where that problem originated? The idea of traceability. This is, was actually a European idea that is being now considered for use in the United States. So what I see is actually a convergence of practices as countries learn uh, about these technologies, as opposed to one system winning over the other. I want to speak to um, the opposite of what is somewhat of an ironic situation in this new field that I'm involved in, which is called synthetic biology, which um, the engineering of plants falls under. Um, in fact, Europe and China are the biggest proponents of this new field, and the U.S. is lagging behind. I am on a number of advisory boards in Europe, and they are asking where and how and when and how fast we should be investing in this. And meanwhile, the U.S. is still trying to figure it out. So it's, it's a little bit ironic that Europe has embraced this, what I began with, this idea that biology is the technology of this century. Europe is embracing that more than the U.S. is. Um, so, uh, a question directly for, for you, Pam. Is it possible to produce uh, these uh, genetically modified plants without a soil medium? There's actually a couple of very technical questions that have been... <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I have to apologize that the closest I come to working on plants was with the iGEM team last summer, and I do know that um, the plants will grow in a, what's called a petri dish. Um, if you, they'll grow to a, a early development stage. Um, but eventually you have to give them soil because I know that my laboratory is sterilizing soil. So we're actually putting soil in our autoclave, which we normally use to sterilize the media. So I think eventually you have to give them soil. <laughs> um, but I think you can, you can come up with some more primitive medias they, they involve water, um, and something that wasn't discussed here is, uh, and maybe it's amongst your questions, is the role that water is going to play mm. in the future of agriculture. And, and that's where, just to digress for a moment, you talked about other traits to be engineered, and one is drought tolerance, mm. which would be very important in third world countries. The products in supermarkets that are labeled non-GMO, uh, what percent do you think um, are truly non-GMO? Is that in the U.S.? Or <laughs> it doesn't say. Yeah, in my old job, there's one topic I always refuse to discuss, and that was labeling. And this is by, because of the complexities associated with the labeling in terms of what the law requires, in terms of uh, 
fa providing factual information, but also uh, writing the labels in such a way that they don't speak about other products without those products wanting to speak. It's a very complex area. So, so, so I actually don't know. The ones that have surprised me are like juices that where the label says that it was produced by people who only wear T-shirts. And I, I just, I really got confused by the value of that. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so I have no answer to that I question. have a, a little bit of a window on this, not so much from the GMO side, but from the side of organic labeling. Um, and I noticed it, there's a very nice write-up here about um, how the U.S. defines what is organic. Mm. And I have a, my best friend has an apple orchard in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and her apples are wonderful. They're as organic as you get. They're full of worms, but they taste really good. But she stopped selling them as organic because it was impossible to meet all the rules that the FDA has put for organic. So I thought that was, in, so now every time I go into the store and I see organic, I think about that story and I think about the other food is probably just as good. <laughs> sort of asking the question from, the, uh, from an, another angle, do either of you think that it will ever become mandatory for food to be labeled as containing GMO ingredients in this country? Mandatory. I, I, I think what may end up happening here is uh, agreeing on a threshold of the quantity that is allowed in the products, which the Europeans have actually set already as a standard where it's a threshold, uh, because we have uh, thresholds for many other products, like how many dead rats you can, that are allowed in grain shipments. This is allowed by law. Uh, or how many rocks, what percentage could be rocks in rice. So people are thinking along those, uh, along those kinds of practices. This is kind of an extreme case. Uh, but uh, many countries have already started going that route of, of saying, instead of arguing against labeling it or not, there probably be some agreement on a, a threshold. So someone wants to know, how about knocking out poison ivy? Any plans on that? Thank you from a severely allergic patient. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that could raise, I mean, because we could talk about this from the <coughs> angle of genetically modifying, you know, this nasty things to not be quite as nasty as they are, is that? Well, I think it? that's a, a fabulous idea. <laughs> um, but I can tell you, that's why I was trying to frame my discussion of eliminating certain genes from certain plants as personal and local, because I don't know that much about poison ivy, but there's probably a reason they make the whatever it is they make that you're allergic to. And, and so I, I guess I, I don't envision a world where we need to uh, recultivate all the poison ivy with ivy that doesn't impact you, but I would like to envision a world where locally, in your own garden, for example, you could, you could have that situation so that you could enjoy your garden or your field. Um, so that's my personal opinion on that. This is uh, interesting because the whole area of allergens, of knocking out genes that cause allergy, this is already being, this is already being done. I think, I think it would be very beneficial uh, to develop uh, that, that area of work. I don't know about uh, poison ivy, but I could think of uses of poison ivy. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, m maybe my future neighbors. <laughs> well, actually, that's an interesting concept of something we call the genetic fence, and, and maybe it's yeah. amongst your questions, but if you have this is something the Harvard students incorporated into their project, and, and it's something that Monsanto thinks about a lot, is um, if you have a genetically engineered crop or a garden, how do you prevent it from either being stolen or escape? And um, 
And so the idea is to have something that's toxic around the perimeter of the garden. So maybe poison ivy would be the solution. I hadn't really thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Pam, someone wants to know, how does the gene gun work? <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> and did you bring one with you tonight? <laughs> actually, I asked my laboratory if we had one, and we don't. Um, I've actually, I've, I've seen it. it. It really is, it's a gun mm. that's mounted on something like this. It's, it's very, it's just mounted there. And, and you put your sample you know, some distance away and it literally just fires like a gun. It's not a very sophisticated instrument. It was developed about 15 or 20 years mm. ago, I think, and it really was derived from a regular gun. It, it was not rocket science, mm -hmm. <laughs> as they say. <laughs> I'm struck by the fact that we really got a ton of questions that are just speaking to concern about you know the effect of GM crops on the environment on the food chain on animals um, in fact I could almost divide 90% of what we got is sort of just this real environmental concern on the one on the one hand and then the other uh, bucket that so many fall into is just concern over this notion of transparency. Right. What are we being told? What should we be told? Why are they not telling us? And uh, I mean, I, I almost kind of hate to <laughs> drop these two very, very broad and very general questions, but that kind of summarizes, I think, what the majority of the people here are, are thinking. So is it possible just to speak a little bit more maybe to just those two things? We've already touched on it, I realize. But. Okay, I'd like to just think about it for a moment what our tolerance is about safety issues in what we put in our bodies um, because you know we have it seems like we have a different kind of tolerance towards drugs versus food and many of us are taking drugs all the time and by the way m many of those drugs and in the future many more of them are going to become from genetic engineering so I, I find this argument sort of interesting, that hmm. the one of what we're willing to tolerate, and I think you framed it about risk in your talk, versus, risk versus benefit, I think, was the way you, you um, talked about this, and maybe you want to frame this somewhat differently, but that's how I think about it. I, I think the, the timing has been very interesting, genetically modified products got on the scene at a time when uh, the global community was becoming increasingly concerned about environment. And then you have a new product that comes that carries environmental risk. It's not that it, they have no risk, they carry risks. The question is to balance between uh, the risks of using those technologies with the risks of not using them. Because the assumption is that if you don't use them, you don't incur any risks. In fact, there are risks uh, for doing nothing. Uh, and, and so the question really is to think about the specific modifications that are being made, the organisms in which those modifications are being made, and the environment in which they're being introduced, mm -hmm. uh, to avoid the kind of a general discussion on whether GM foods are safe for the environment or not. So I could think of, uh, say, if you take corn, for example, if you modify corn and introduce it in Mexico, where it's in a pro close proximity with the native varieties, that would, be of, would create a, a bigger concern on the part of the public than if you're introducing it in a place where it doesn't have close relatives. So, so the only, the, really, the, the issue for me, it's not to debate the issues, but to reason through the issues. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we need to do. And many of the concerns that are being raised, uh, say environmental impacts, have actually turned out to be true. The question is what scale uh, are they, what magnitude are these risks? Are they risks that we can tolerate or are they risks that we cannot, we cannot tolerate? It becomes more of a, 
really a management, a management issue. And, and so on the transparency question, I've been following very closely the, the work that's being done right now by a company here in Waltham on a transgenic salmon, the regulatory procedures for it. It's remarkable how many documents and the extent to which the FDA has been absolutely transparent uh, with all the documents calling for hearings so that if anybody really wanted to know what's going on, they have every opportunity. And we now have more, even more tools for making this information uh, available. And so, so, so I think there's a lot more uh, transparency now than there was, say, 10, 10 years ago. And, and many of our arguments about the lack of transparency are informed by perceptions that are two decades old. Uh, because I don't think that the, the initial introduction of genetically modified foods was done with sufficient transparency. In fact, the, me, the, the model that was used at the time was a medical model saying that, basically saying, this is like a drug and you don't go and consult everybody in the general public when you're introducing a new medicine. Uh, and so, but the industry has learned a lot from that time. There's a lot more consultation. There's a lot more consideration for how you share the benefits of new technologies. For example, at this particular moment, Monsanto, which is going to release drought-tolerant maize very soon, actually crops very soon, is very concerned that countries that experience drought are able to benefit from those trades at the same time when they're introducing their, their varieties here in the United States. And these are basically practices that have come out of just learning from how the public deals with new technologies. We are, we are going to conclude here. Um, I would like to thank our two speakers.